when a business owner hires their first salesperson, what they don't realize is they play the critical role of still being the current sales leader. And what's a really, like, what's a part I, I saw a lot go wrong, especially when I was starting and more working with smaller businesses where it was their first salesperson, was the sales leader immediately stopping to sell and then leaving the new person going, Oh, okay, I'll work it out and everything, but not having that sales leadership. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Organization Business Podcast. I am your host, Lynn Pedetti. Now, if you are struggling to hire or retain great salespeople for your business, this is an episode not to be missed because you will meet my guest today, Adam Beverly, a member of EO Queensland Accelerator Program, founder of APB Sales Strategy, which is a sales recruitment agency specializing in facilities, services, businesses. In this episode, Adam shared tips on what to look out for when hiring salespeople, how to ensure they are motivated and loyal, as well as ways to onboard your salespeople for success. Now, join me for an insightful episode with Adam. Welcome to the show, Adam. I was so excited to speak with you today. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we had an earlier chat and I told you that I was going through the recruitment of salespeople and it's just perfect timing that we get to talk because, <laughs> you know, already I was so excited asking all these questions, but yeah. I, I saved the rest for today. Now, before we get started into the topic about, you know, sales consultants and niching and everything else, maybe share a little bit about how you got started in this industry in the first place. Okay. So how I got started, so I started my business about two and a half years ago. Um, prior to that, I was at uh, the business B2B side of Optus in Queensland, and I'd done everything from being a BDM to the later part of being a sales manager. So my experience from recruiting salespeople came from basically being a sales manager and being a salesperson. Um, and then just to summarize it, I wanted to eventually start my own business. So I took all my expertise and skills and passion in that field and created a business that was initially not just sales recruitment, but sales coaching and training at the time. And then very quickly, I found myself doing more sales recruitment than coaching. And then next thing you know, it two and a half years later, we're a sales recruitment agency. So it wasn't intentional. It wasn't the only thing I, did, I went out to do, but it's now the thing we're known for and now we also just niche into the into one industry as well. We recruit salespeople for, which is the um, facility services industry in um, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. Yeah, I was really uh, impressed at the way you niche. So, how did you come about that particular industry? Was it your favorite client that you work with, or you had someone? No, yeah, it's a mixture of things. So, one of it was. Um, you know, to really provide value in sales recruitment, what I found was it had to be the client needed a profile and was, you know, really set on that profile having industry sales experience. Like it had to be the most important thing because otherwise when it comes to ad, like running your own ads, if you if your business can, you know, train someone up without any experience in, in selling in your industry, and it's just a pure, you know, attitude and attribute hire, then an ad will work. And then we don't really serve much value there because then you can just get a candidate like that. So I started to find these industries like the one we're in now where all the businesses wanted people who had industry sales experience for a number of reasons. So that's end that's how we ended up going down that that track. Um and more of a headhunting outreach approach and sourcing our candidates that way instead of, you know, running ads and because then we, we just run into the same problem that, you know, we're solving for our clients. So that, that's how, that's how we ended up there. So talking about the sales challenge, because I, I always invite entrepreneurs here or EO members here to be able to share something that they've personally gone through in their business. And yeah. if, you know, sales is actually something that your expertise in love to yeah. hear about what was your challenge when you uh, had to deal with salespeople? Uh, with salespeople, it's definitely being very clear on, um, it's a lot of things, but I, I, I need to summarize, I guess, these topics, which is you when you, before you even go to hire a salesperson, you got to at least give it six months to work out. Um, there's probably at least a good six months of planning you need to do before you even hire someone, I feel. And you need to have ver a very clear target, at least an annual target of however 
much revenue it is. You need to be clear on, is it revenue? Is it GP? What is the actual target made of? What counts towards that target? So you could be clear on the target. Then you've got to reverse engineer all the uh, leading and lagging KPIs to that target. And then only then, once you've worked out that, you've got to first make sure it's already been achieved in the business. You know, have you done that yourself as the business owner? Have, do you have other salespeople doing it? And then you can start working out the profile. And then what does that profile involve? Do they need experience? How much are you prepare to pay them? What's the commissions like? So there's lots of different things, but yeah, that's pretty summarized, yeah. I guess. So is that something that you personally experience when you're working Optus? Did you see that they were making mistakes and yes. got to, you know, yeah. basically realize that you can solve a problem like this? Although I didn't work at a national level, like I focused on Queensland and I was always networking with the other top performers, whether it was a sales manager in Sydney or another BDM in Melbourne. And it was just a common problem of, you know, you you either it, it, you'd either hire people from let's say Telstra who had all this experience, but then for some reason never worked at it off this, and then you'd also hire fresh people who'd been in B two B sales and they wouldn't work they wouldn't work out either. So it was very difficult because um, it was a yeah very different company, and it's one of the reasons why I don't work in telecommunications anymore. Is it's a very it's its own beast, and there's um, you can get the best salesperson from the other the other the other side and they just don't work out or they do so it's there's a lot more that goes into it um so i just worked out over time that you needed to use you needed to leverage uh people like recruiters which we ended up using so we i actually came to my boss one day and said let's use a recruiter i know this recruiter friend of mine i'm sure he can help no didn't even know what recruiters did back then and he just gave us people who just had you know, great attitude, great attributes, you know, it really vetted and qualified their, their, their skills and abilities. And they didn't have any experience. Actually, most of them didn't even have any sales experience. So they were just completely just fresh molds and that worked really well for the business. So, um, so it's a completely, completely different strategy, um, that one compared to what I do now, you know? Ah, okay. So since yeah. you, in you're in recruitment have you made any mistakes in recruitment like what have you learned uh, oh i made a ton I, I made a ton of mistakes so all the mistakes i've a lot of the mistakes i've made of hiring my own business has been i've missed critical parts that i would have gotten right for a client like for example wow. my first ever hire um i lasted one week because i just didn't gauge the I guess longevity of that person and it was so obvious but i just i just missed it so i missed the longevity piece which is like you know and, and it, yeah last a week <laughs> so that was my first that was my first hire and then um yeah i've had you know i've had many others since then but you've also got to accept the fact too that you will you know you can put all the strategy you can work with a recruiter and you still most likely will get it wrong but it's you've just got to get it right as well. It's one of those things that if you get right, you get heap, you get more money in time straight away in yeah. a business. It's one of those only one of those business strategies that can give you more money in time if you can get that right, which is so valuable to every business, you know. So yeah, yeah. So quite interesting with your comment around even when you guys hired someone from Telstra to go yeah. adopt it. Yeah, you think that's a perfect match? Like what? Yeah, um, you would think so. Happened? You would think so. So like back then they were obsessed with um, getting people from that side of the industry thinking, oh, well, there's been, this guy's been here for 10 years. He must be killing it. Well, turns out, you know, they didn't have the strictest targets and KPIs. So for the last five years, the guy was cruising, you know, so he might have done really well for the first five years, but the last five is cruising, you know, and um, so it's, it's industry dependent. It depends on where they come from, you know, and we've spent a lot of time in our own business now developing, even almost pre-vetting where we get our own candidates from based off the companies they work for, because we know the culture where we've dealt with people in that business. So we can sort of assume a little bit how driven they are just where, with where they work, and then we can qualify that even further. So that's a really big, that's a really big part. Mm. So with salespeople, 
describe them? Like what would make someone, are they all the same? Like, I, I guess I'm a business owner. I never learned yeah. sales. I end up, well, you have to sell. And yeah. I'm assuming, do I have to find, I mean, I don't have, I'm at the moment trying to hire outbound salespeople uh, for myself because we've done content marketing. We've got a lot of inbound. So we've got, now we have to hire people to do outbound. And yeah. so I'm sitting here, do I hire people that look and sound like me? <laughs> yeah. That are, the extroverted are they all the same or they are all they uh, very different so before you even i guess look at the profile of what type of sales people you hire you've got to have your strategy in place you've got to have a process and you've got to make sure you have all the right tools so provided you have all of that you know right when you look at the profile then it's going to depend on um who what sort of leader do they work well under so when a business owner hires their first salesperson, what they don't realize is they play the critical role of still being the current sales leader. And what's a really, like, what's a part I, I saw a lot go wrong, especially when I was starting and more working with smaller businesses where it was their first salesperson, was the sales leader immediately stopping to sell and then leaving the new person going, Oh, okay, I'll work it out and everything, but not having that sales leadership. And it's so it's so hard to balance that because you think, oh, I'll put on the salesperson, they'll just start selling for me and I can go just do this. No, you've got to basically keep selling until you've got your own sales leader. And that that can take years. And that's the position I'm in, even in my own business. You know, I've gone through stages where I've gassed up and on as I put people and ultimately now I I know I've got to stay in it because I've got to build my own sales leader first and you've got to have a team to do that. So it's a, it's a long, you got to have that long-term view as well for it to work. Yeah. Um, so you're saying here, even if you're willing to pay and you hire someone very experienced uh, at a mature age, being 10, 15 years in, in, in the industry, what is the, I guess, the the time that we would we could expect for them to start making sales? Because it sounded like everyone- It depends. So it's going to depend on the industry and the process and everything. So for example, in our industry, on average, we start seeing them pay for themselves in the first three to six months. But the sales cycle in the industry we focus on is like six months to a year on some of these deals. Like, But if you've got a more transactional business, it should be, it could be from week one, the first month, the first 90 days. But all that planning I mentioned before about setting targets and reversing, reverse engineering the KPIs, you should be able to work that out how quickly they should pay for themselves. And that should be their first, their first, you know, a couple numbers that they're aiming to hit too. So you should basically know this stuff as well before you, you do it. Yeah. And in terms of compensating, uh, what are the best ways to compensate that makes, you know, salespeople become, you know, motivated or want to long, uh, last long with you? Is there any tips around yeah. that? So it's not just money. Funny enough, it's it's not just money. I've learned that one the hard way as well, where, uh, you know, you can pay someone, you can give them the best commission structure ever, and that still doesn't cut it for a certain person. They might want mm -hmm. more recognition. They might want more of a success, like a, a career progression. So it's either money, career progression, or work-life balance, or mm -hmm. recognition, so, or a combination of those four. You know, by default, you can sort of get away with just more money by by default, but you do need to work out with them from day one, hey, what what is their, not their motivation right now, but what's the motivation the next one year, two years, three years? Do they want to be a part owner? Do they want to be a leader? You know, what is it that they really want long-term? And that's sort of what the com compensation plan gets crafted around um and then yeah that's that that's sort of how you work it out <laughs> yeah yeah and when it comes to the sales people that you hire for do you yeah. hire people that generate their own leads or are they a combination yes. of people that uh yeah. do more account management so our our number one specialty even before we niche down into the industry when is business development managers which is such a loose loose title these days but essentially what that means for us is they're self-generating business. They're clo they're doing the entire sales process from end to end, and also as well, they're managing to a certain extent client relationships. Maybe, and that part can vary from BDM role to BDM role. But essentially, it is if you put on someone a BDM, let's say in our in 
this industry, they should be able to start generating their own business and closing it. And you shouldn't really need to help too much with marketing and sales functionality. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like 360 degree sales is what we call it. So that's our main, our main focus. And then we've got sales leadership roles and client retention and client account roles as well. But our main bread and butter is account, um, business development roles, BDM. Yeah. So do you recommend that we're, if we hire someone for the purpose of developing, getting more business in, to keep them in that role rather than trying to get them then to handle a bit of more client work? Because does that yeah. take away from the core yeah, work? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Whether it's like a senior BDM or your first salesperson, the more you can just keep them focused on sales, the better it is. But, you know, that's not possible with every business. Um, but ideally you take off as much client management as well. So especially, at least if you can take off the delivery from them, any part of delivery that they've got to do, which they shouldn't have, um, and client management, client management for two reasons. One, it helps them keep focus, but two, it protects the business's actual client relationship. So I've seen this time and time again in the, like the industry we're in and other industries where you get a BDM. And because the business never took the clients off them, they just take the clients with them when they go. So oh, it's for two two reasons. You want to like keep them focused on just new business, new business, and in that mentality. And then the second is just like to protect the business. Like you, they've just acquired this client, get them, bring them to someone who's um, a, a client manager, an account manager. You know, have that process um, drawn up. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Haven't thought about that. Yeah. So in terms of um, when it comes to the process of recruiting and then onboarding, are there some hacks that you would suggest? Because one hack that I came up with, I don't yeah. know if it's yes or not, but basically as part of our recruitment process, we just started to do, we did, uh, well, we vetted, we interviewed, and then we actually did like a mock-up call. So a mock-up call is, so this is prior to hiring them at, like, you know, they're just going through the stages, but I, we decided like, hey, why don't they sell to one of our team members uh, one of their products, you know, something that they've um, sold before. So, you know, they don't have to try to think, you know, uh, or learn anything. They just have to show that they're good at selling something they're already familiar with. And um, we just found it to be really interesting, eye-opening, because the interview, the way they're performing the interview versus the way they sold to us was, you know, very, very different. So I was just curious to know if you come up with anything like that or yeah. any way. Look, yeah. that it, what you're saying is so important for basically like junior sales roles where you're not doing an experience hire, you know, that's so important that you must have something like that. But if it came to like you're hiring an experienced person in the industry who's been doing it for 10 years, it's unnecessary to do that. But for someone where it's like they've either never done it before and, they're, and you're planning to train them up, then yes, you should do something like that, which is basically like the classic Jordan Belfort, sell me this pen thing, okay, right? Hey, that's that's, right. that's what yeah. you're doing. And um, yeah, I highly, re like I do. So when I, I hire unexperienced salespeople in my business because of how my business works, I do the exact same thing. So, um, and anyone else, I would recommend, yeah, doing that if it's a, a first hire. Work out a way where you can actually test them um, to... You, whatever it is and I like the actually the idea you mentioned of doing it with a team member because then the team member can be like oh I'm not sort of sold or not so it also mm -hmm. removes your bias so that's actually a good one um yeah what you're doing there and how about training them um you know when they come on board like what's yeah. the best process to to train them to get them up to speed so you got two options one is you develop your own training and this will take a lot longer to do because you've got to then document or your own, everything you know, you basically would have to document. And basically, before this person starts, have like a playbook, but a very fleshed out playbook from your own experiences, but also ensuring that you don't have any, like what I call like director sales effect, where it where there's th stuff that you're saying works, but it's really because you're the director. So mm. all the stuff in my playbook is all stuff that I've tested without the client knowing I'm the owner, that mm. I can that I can honestly say there's work because they didn't know. 
So you've got to have that. And then the other option is pay pay a sales trainer, get a business coach, um, invest in that stuff because it's one of those things where you will get you, you do get a return on developing the sales skills of your team. Like I spend we spend quite a bit of money developing our team here. It's not something I do anymore. I if I was stuck doing the training role, I we probably wouldn't grow as much. So now I've got someone who does that and I think it's really worth any business doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we currently put our team in like a sales program so that way they've got a course that they're going through and yeah. life coaching every week. But if I'm talking about like a brand new um hire and they're like yeah. senior, I'm hiring them because they said they're a pro, they're they're a senior. Are you saying that we they still need to be trained to do that um, job? You well, what you'd want to do is qualify what part that you don't want them doing in your sales process and work out what that is very quickly and then work out can you can you adapt can you un- not untrain it because that's the last resort but like how can you deal with that because people can say oh I'll change I won't do it like that but habit habits are hard to break um for some people so yeah so to answer that question, um, you just want to work out what it is that you don't want them doing and try and prevent them from doing that and then train on top of it if you can. But everyone need like even the most experienced salespeople I've met, they're, you know, they've got all this good stuff over here, but then there's this ten percent over here that they maybe have never gotten proper training on, you know? Um yeah. mm. so everyone can use with training. Yeah, awesome. And now I'm just curious. You worked in Optus. Was that Optus for a long time? Yeah, the business. Yeah, for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, and you excelled in your role. I would love for you to describe, you know, what was different about you. Like, what what, are, what do you do? What's your morning routine? Like, how do you operate as this salesperson so that, you know, when I'm hiring or when I'm starting to work with people, I can just kind of go, oh, yeah, this is how I would expect that kind of person to, to operate. Uh- Okay, this is, I, I want to say, this is going to sound advanced, but it really shouldn't be, um, is the schedule. So I can't remember exactly who said this to me a while ago, but he always, but someone said to me, success is in the schedule. So I want to see that person's schedule. What does that schedule look like? Um, I've always had uh, a routine towards the, not always at Optus, but towards the end I worked at, oh, this routine thing is actually, you know, helping me they're on track um i've got a way better routine that i have now than when i was in sales but i i think it's definitely just the schedule like what have their day planned out and it's not micromanagement um and if the salesperson says you're micromanaging me that's a red flag it's just you're sort of just keeping them in order because it's so easy to just chase after this has come up this has come up like you need some structure to your day so Having structure to your day, a schedule is really important. Um, can, and you can't, yeah, can you give yeah. an example? Like what would a typical day look like? Is it like you batch it up where this is a outbound day, this is a follow-up day, or is it yeah. like half or So it, it does depend. So for me, uh, for me, I don't have day themes. I used to have day themes. So I used to have one day was meetings, one day was this, one day was that type of thing. I don't have that anymore. I just have a cycle during the day that's the same pretty much every day, which is in the morning, I do all my follow-ups. I do all my outbound heavy stuff in the morning. I try and get it done before 10 a.m. And then I'm doing um, I'm doing basically my end. Uh, I'm doing my, well, this is for recruitment, but I'm doing all my candidate work sort of in the uh, towards the afternoon. But it, all my business development stuff is generally done in the morning. And then I'm following up also at the end of the day. So I might, in my BD cycle, speak to someone three times in one day, one early in the morning, one towards before lunch, and then one basically at five o'clock. So I've hit all the windows, the morning, the midday lunch, and then, it, you know, also the five o'clock onwards. So, mm. yeah. I like that. I'm a, I'm a person of schedule as well. So I love yeah. every calendar. Uh, so do you suggest having to look, I mean, check the calendar or how do we know that? A set, service person is doing that. You've got to set it up for them. So yeah. it's not something that you go, oh, yeah, set up. you got to basically go, I know this schedule works. I want you to do the schedule. And you're introducing it from day one. 
And you're also getting buy-in in the interview process of, hey, we have a sales process. We have a sales schedule. We have this, we have that. So when they come in, they have their schedule like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, you told me about this. Whereas if you don't do that, it can sort of come across as you're, you know, you're man- micromanaging them too much at the start. So get buy-in on you work on a schedule. And unfortunately, like the best salespeople are not good at schedules. Like I, I, there's parts of my schedule I still suck at. I still get distracted, but I'm way better at just having something in place. Uh, even if it makes me 10% better, like it's, it's still worth having. Yeah. Yeah. I think we do get better with time. Like in, in the past, my habit building was, you know, horrible, but now it's, it gets easier over time. Yeah, um, absolutely. As we're running out of time, I love, I want to understand a little bit about, you know, what motivated you to, um, you know, persist in business or, or get into the sales game or like, yeah. what is it about that you really love? Um, okay. Or for others. So bit of background, like my mum and dad are both business owners. My mum and dad are, were both the salespeople in their businesses that they've started. So I've got to say it's probably mum and dad just re- being raised in a very business orientated family. Um, I went, I went to a pretty, a pretty good school in Sydney and everyone wanted to be a lawyer, a doctor, accountant. I was like, at the time it's, I sort of cringe when I say this, but I wanted to sell real estate because uh, I, that was the only sales job I thought was like sales at the time. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go off. I'm going to move back home to the Gold Coast where I'm from. I'm going to sell real estate. That didn't happen. But mm-hmm. that sort of was my motivation was I just wanted to sell um, because I knew if you were good enough, you could build a business. So I saw sales as the key of building a business and then ultimately money and freedom from there. So um, that's sort of what got me into it. And then starting my business was, I just got to the point, I just nailed five years and I, you know, was already the best BDM in Queensland. I was one of the top salespeople at the time. I had got to experience what building a sales team was like. And I just wanted to start my own thing. You know, I didn't really know what it was going to be at the time. It was going to be this sales business thing. And it ended up being sales recruitment. So yeah. um, that's how it happened, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's no, a great idea. So this is your first business? Yeah, this is my first business. And I'm sure I'll have more businesses eventually, but this is um, this is the business I'm I'm scaling at the moment and um, I'm going to put a lot of time into it. Yeah. And has the business um, turned out to be the way you imagine? Is it harder, a bit the same, easy? I've had times where I've definitely had those moments which I didn't understand prior to business. You know, maybe with my dad and my mum, like when I was growing up, seeing them have parts where they where they struggled with business and not really, of course, understanding. And you know, business friends, even when I was at Optus, like, oh yeah, I know it's hard, but then there's been some times like, yeah, it's hard, you know. <laughs> And I've had that and I just think now it's just about how much pressure you can really handle, you know, and if you can get through it, it just works out in the end. And that's always been my mentality. Um, you know, I've, I've had things happen where I've gone, okay, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty bad, but you know what, I've gone through something that was like 5% worse. So I'm going to get through this one and I'll be, it'll work out. So Mm. that's my mentality now about it. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is like a personal development journey with yeah, this. It's really it is. Learning to so yeah. I guess ultimately, you know, with if, with everything that you're trying to do, succeeding in business, you know, what do you want to leave behind for the world, or what do you want to be remembered for? I I've always wanted, and what maybe this was one part I didn't mention about going to sales is mm-hmm. I've always seen sales as like that profession that should have education built around it. So ultimately, I would love to one day get sales and even entrepreneurship into high schools around mm. the world. Like I, I was an academic at all and high school didn't give me that outlet to be a sales professional. I just worked it out and I got into it. Right. So I just feel there's a lot of great entrepreneurs and sales professionals that never ever get their opportunity because it's never, it's never shown as a valid profession. You, you just yeah. end up in it. Like I've seen heaps yeah. of friends from high school who have just starting their sales career now, seven, eight years later. I was like, I, I'd already done that because I, I got into it. You know, now they're now they're in it now, and it's like, yeah, I'd love to be known for 
getting that institutionalized, I guess, or making that in a form of edu- prof- you know, professional education for high school students at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I totally agree with you. Um, if you can sell, you can sell anything, right? You can start any yeah. business. And if anything, it allows you to then be the owner because if often if, you, if you're skilled at something, you're just stuck in doing that work. But if yeah. you're if skilled, you can start anything, you know, a b- bottled business, selling whatever lights, anything. Exactly. Really- it, it definitely limits how much you can serve or impact, make whatever impact if your sales skills are a 2 out of 10, but you're a 10 out of 10 of this whatever profession. It's like you'll only be a 2 out of 10 at that profession, sort of like the, the cap to it. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for That's all right. being with me today. I, I felt like I got mentored because of the information that I needed. So I'll yeah. make sure all your details in the description below so people can connect with you on uh, LinkedIn, the such, right? Is that what awesome. you're all- Yeah, absolutely. And of course, if you're in the commercial cleaning industry, uh, I'd love to hear from you if you see this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Adam. Bye. Okay. See you. Bye.